A bit of a topsy turvy Merseyside derby last night, but a victory for Liverpool in the end. They beat Everton by two goals to nil. I'm delighted to say broadcaster Gareth Roberts and Patrick Boylan from the Athletic are with us now. Gareth, I might start with you. The um, the swings of a season on a single moment as the ball comes back off the upright and Liverpool sweep the length of the pitch to score a goal. It's mad how an entire season can sometimes be distilled into 12, 14 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think um, we were all wary of Everton's threats on set pieces, particularly with the added sprinkle of Daesh. Um, and so, you know, in that moment, I think hearts were in mouths. But as you say, you know, Liverpool, 13, 14 seconds later, are up the other end of the pitch. They put it in the back of the net and then they're on the way. And I thought once once Liverpool scored, I thought you really saw the confidence come back. I mean, there's clearly been an issue with that. There's been a bit of a mental block, I think, with the players this season. I think sort of starting the season in the manner that they did and sort of the title disappearing into the distance so quickly has affected them mentally. But hopefully this is this is a bit of a chink of light. This is, it was huge for Liverpool, this. I mean, I, I, as usual, people are playing it down online because there's always... There's always a Grinch online to tell you you shouldn't enjoy yourself around football. Uh, but I certainly did. I thought, you know, this is a vital period for Liverpool now. If we'd have been beaten last night, heads would have been down. You could see everything falling apart and Liverpool falling into, you know, a pit of crap season, if you like. But they've, they've got one hand on the rung and they can start to pull themselves up now, hopefully. Yeah, Patrick, that um, it did. It was on the verge of being a Sean Dyche masterclass where the team is not the best team in the game. Score a header from a, a corner kick like that and away you go. But um, such fine margins. And, and I guess it just goes to show how fragile Everton are at the moment. Yeah, it, it does. Obviously, it was kind of, I suppose, a minute that epitomised Everton and Merseyside derbies, but probably particularly so at Anfield. Um, whatever can go wrong does tend to go wrong. So when that ball rebounds, it doesn't just rebound, but there's also a kind of a, a Liverpool deflection that springs the counter for them. One of the things that occurred to me more or less straight away is obviously Liverpool break really quickly and that's their preferred method of attacking the opposition goal. But just how athletic they were compared to Everton. So effectively it became a foot race between Darwin Nunez uh, Cody Gakpo and Mohamed Salah, V on the Everton side, Dwight McNeil, a 33-year-old Idris Gay, and an ageing Seamus Coleman. And from that point on, there was only going to be one winner in the game. Uh, the, the irony for Everton is that I think actually after a very shaky start, they'd settled into the game a little bit in that period. They, they'd started to build attacks, they'd won a few corners and obviously came closest to uh, to uh, to breaking the deadlock and open, opening the scoring. Um, but the higher Everton seemed to push, the more it played into Liverpool's hands. And as Gareth says, from the moment Liverpool gained that ascendancy, I don't think there was any doubt as to who was going to win the game. I think um, Patrick Sean Dyche described Jordan Pickford's decision as a, a bit of a misread after the match, which would be a <laughs> bit of an understatement, I think. Um, he really just said to Mo Salah, here's the goal, just just help yourself. Yeah, it was it was bizarre, wasn't it? It was almost looking like he was scrambling to compensate for other people's errors, <laughs> but it made the wrong decision in the in the in the split second. I mean, if 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 that was a misread, as Sean Dyche puts it, then I think there were four or five in the build up. Um, I'm not entirely sure why Seamus Coleman doesn't bring the Liverpool man down on the on the on the edge of the Liverpool box. Um, Idrissa Gay loses the foot race with Darwin Nunez, but he's probably always going to lose that particular battle. And then again, I'm not sure what Vitaly Mikolenko is doing in in the middle of the the penalty area, leaving three Liverpool players free. Like it kind of felt like there was a catalogue of errors that made Jordan Pickford do something mad, and that, that's not excusing what Pickford did, but it, it is to say that it, it it's on more than just him. And even if you look at the second goal and Connor Cody leaving the ball somewhat inexplicably, inexplicably after after a deflection on the cross. Everton were their own worst enemies last night. I think they, they played into Liverpool's hands, but they they also they were guilty of squandering the ball in, in such dangerous positions time after time. And not always because of kind of like a fierce Liverpool press. I mean, it counted three times that James Tarkovsky just gave the ball straight to Liverpool and started attacks. And um, it, it was kind of exactly what Liverpool needed to get back into their groove. And and obviously they did that. I thought they played very well on the night. Gareth, Patrick mentioned their fierce Liverpool press. There, there was an element of, of a lot of that that we haven't seen from Liverpool in, in recent months. And all of a sudden it was there last night. One name that, that probably stands out 
for a lot of people is, is Stefan Bajetic in the middle of the park mm. 18 years of age I mean he, he really put his hand up not just last night but in recent games as, as the player who's is almost leading the way in many ways yeah, which is mad, isn't it? Um, I mean, I think um, he said himself in an interview after the game that, you know, it's not very long ago he was playing youth football um, and, and now he's sort of the star man at Anfield in a Merseyside derby. And I have to be honest, I, I've been impressed by him, but I was a little bit worried. Um, Everton have got physicality in the middle of the park and I thought maybe he'd be muscled out of this game a little bit. I think Everton tried that early on. Um, there was a few sort of challenges in on him, which you know to sort of test his metal, if you like. But he came through that. He emerged and and he, and he played his own game. And I thought he was playing some fantastic passes. He was getting stuck in, and there was actually a chance towards the end where I thought it opened up for him. And you know I was getting sort of shades of Steven Gerrard. I just thought put your foot through that. You know if that hits the back of the net, the roof's going to come off. But he decided to play the pass. I think there's plenty of time to come from, isn't there? You know, 18 years old, putting in a performance like that is really positive. And, and look, you know, there, there was a bit of a sort of, you know, a narrative around the game. I was listening to a lot of the build-up media and stuff in, in the day before the game. And there was a lot of stuff about that, about, you know, Liverpool, uh, a soft touch. Liverpool can be got out in the middle of the park. Everton are sort of, you know, dogs of war rebooted under Sean Dyche and this is going to be their day. So... I think there was a bit there was a huge pressure on Liverpool, huge pressure on an eighteen year old lad playing in the middle of the park. And you know, he passed that test with flying colours. The thing is that build up all seemed true, Gareth, over the last month. I think this is their first yeah. win of, of the calendar year. Like yeah. y- Liverpool were kind of in a situation where you could almost make any statement about them stick because it had been so chaotic, so disorganised, so out of character. So that I look you know, you, you can't say this is going to turn the whole season around, but certainly the front three played well as a unit. There's some strength and depth coming back in terms of players on the bench last night. Jota gets some game time and all of a sudden things start to look a little bit better. Yeah, loads of positives, as you say there. I mean, you know, to see Jota coming off the bench, Firmino coming off the bench, Van Dijk being on the bench, all of those things, fantastic for Liverpool, obviously. And then, you know, seeing a performance from Jordan Henderson again, um, he, he's looked a little shot when he's been involved. He's not, he, he's not, he's not got the minutes in this season, and we've missed them. Um, and I, I thought he put a decent performance in last night as well. I enjoyed when he closed down Pickford and put in a tackle. I think at that particular moment that lifted the crowd. And you know, that's what you need in Merseyside derbies, little moments like that, little sort of, you know, signals of effort from the players. And I thought everything was right. You know, you, you're right to say that there's so many stories about Liverpool in in the last few weeks that have been right. And, and you know, Jurgen himself has has talked about body language, has talked about not winning your challenges, not winning your battles. Um, I thought he did all of that last night, and you know, I enjoyed him as well. I thought there was a lot of honesty from from Jurgen post match. You know, he said he was relieved. He knew the pressure was on a little bit. He was even talking at one point there in his post-match interview about taking his clothes off. And, you know, I think I think we all felt like that a little bit. You know, this was absolutely vital. And you're right to say, you know, it does, it's only one game. It's only three points. But there's just that little chink of light now. You know, can Liverpool now take that on, go to Newcastle, get a result there? All of a sudden, you know, it would have seemed mad almost a week or so ago to say, they can still get top four. Now you look like slightly less crazy and saying, well, it's a possibility at least. What about the, the Daesh era? Um, what what are you hearing from around the club and, and just in terms of what the team is going to look like? Because obviously two massive games to start with, the team who've been the best team in the country, uh, first day out and then a Merseyside derby second day out. So it, it's too early to draw any conclusions, but um, what are the early indications from around the club about how things are working out for him, Patrick? Yeah, they've, they've largely been positive, to be honest. Um, I think he, he came in and it was almost like a breath of fresh air. And, and so far as he was simplifying messaging, trying to get the players to focus on kind of their success, their history over an extended period of time as individuals to get where they are now. Um, lots of positive messaging. Obviously, a spectacular opening game where they not only beat Arsenal, but thoroughly deserve to beat Arsenal. Um, the side that you think will probably go on and win the league. So a, a lot of the early signs have been positive. Um, certainly the fans have warm warm to his his, his kind of no nonsense style and his and his straight talking. Uh, last night felt like a bit of regression. It, it felt more like a Lampard performance than a than a Sean Dyche performance. And what I mean by that was that Everton just looked fragile, particularly in transition. They looked fragile. 
Um, but also on the ball, they were ponderous and and lacking in energy. I just thought it was a limp performance all around from Everton. So it was a bit of regression. But I think there's an acceptance from the fan base that Dice is coming at this from a very low bar. He's inheriting a group of players that are flawed. There are obvious, serious deficiencies in the squad. And we saw that last night with Calvert-Lewin being substitute, substituted out of the starting lineup for, for a 22-year-old in Ellis Sims, uh, a pretty thankless task for him in, in an away derby at Anfield. Um, so this is going to be a, it's going to be a kind of a steady thing that needs to build over time. Dice doesn't have loads of time to get it right, but, but he needs to do the best he can with this group of players. And I think, to be honest, if you asked Dice and if you'd asked Everton before these two games and said, would you take three points from Arsenal and, and Liverpool? The answer probably would have been a resounding yes. However disappointing last night's game was. Um, the big challenge now is Everton have tended to fare OK against the big teams this season. They've tended to to grind out results and, and have a structure off the ball that's conducive to, to limiting the best teams in the league. Where they've really fallen short is in imposing themselves on weaker opposition on dictating play and carving out chances. There's a there's an obvious lack of cre- creativity in the side, but there's an obvious lack of goals too, which is why they're down towards the bottom end of the league for, for goals scored. The run coming up is pivotal. You've got Leeds on Saturday, which is kind of your perennial cliched six-pointer in the relegation battle. Then it's Aston Villa at home the weekend after. And then I think you've got a trip to Arsenal followed by a trip to Nottingham Forest. That feels like a really decisive period in Everton's season. If if the if they were to get two or three wins from that run, then you probably look at it and think they're going to be okay. They, they've got enough points on the board just to drag themselves over the line here. Um, but if they were to lose to Leeds and, and Aston Villa, certainly, then I think you, you are starting to stir down the barrel. So it, it's all on this next run for me. It's all on this next four or five that, that... and on. And so, how Dyche can get these players to respond to to what was a, a serious disappointment last night. I think you mentioned no nonsense approach there, uh, Patrick from from Dyche and Alex Iwobi was speaking after the Arsenal win and saying he he, he, he he couldn't move off the couch after the game. He was so <laughs> wrecked tired. I think they ran more in that game than they had at any point under Frank Lampard's tenure, which which speaks volumes. Uh, he's banned snoods and hats and training and all this sort of uh, classic yeah. Dyche Dycheisms. But but clearly the players will respond to that. You know. The, that, that no nonsense approach is something that um, clearly Burnley players responded to. So, so why not Everton? Yeah, I, I think it's seen as a bit retrograde on the outside, and I do understand why. What you've got to do, I think, in the modern game in particular, is explain why you're doing things to these players. You need to you need to tell the players, "I'm doing this for reason X." And in the case of the snoods and the the long socks and the shin pads in training, the the logic from Dyche's side is that he. he, he these are the things that you play with in the game. You you, you can you wear long socks, you wear shin pads. You need to train as you're going to play in a match. So that kind of makes sense, and I think the players have bought into that. Um, in in so far as the, the the running goes, I think the, the the league average before the Arsenal game is about 109 kilometres as a collective. Um, they were up at 116 against Arsenal, so obviously that's a marked improvement. Dice wants that kind of strong running and. That kind of, I think he presses higher, particularly at home, than than a lot of people give him credit for. Um, so there have been no kind of notable deviations already from what Lampard did and Lampard's kind of pre- preferred style. He wanted to make Everton fundamentally more progressive as a side, in, in particularly in possession. Um, but the game against Liverpool did feel like they'd lapsed back into a lot of those bad habits, kind of leaving players isolated against the pace of Salah and, and Gakpo on the break. It, like I say, it did it felt like it played into um into Liverpool's hands. And that's probably more on that group of players than Sean Dyche. I think he just probably needs a little bit longer to completely embed his methods at the, at the football club. Uh, Gareth, the other big story yesterday um, came from the independent group looking at the handling of the Champions League final and they've laid the blame squarely at the door of UEFA, which I think any of us who were there at the time understood fully that uh, there was a lot of responsibility and it certainly wasn't the fans who were just trying to go about their business to get to the game. Um, What was the response from Liverpool fans that you were speaking to yesterday about the report? What did you make of the report? 
I mean, first of all, first of all, I think it's it's worth saying that it's it's shambolic how it's come out. Um, you know, for it to take this long and then for it to come out via leaks to the media and, and a copy not even arrive on the doorstep of Liverpool Football Club uh, says an awful lot about the shambles that remains around UEFA. Um, it, it comes as no surprise, I, I think, to Liverpool fans. We 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 know that that our own were not at fault uh, for what happened out in Paris, and and as the report itself says, it's in fact the actions of Liverpool fans that present, uh, prevented it from being much worse. And you know, you say you know everyone who was there knows what unfolded and knows what happened, but you know, I'm still seeing people who who trotted out you know, mistruths on the day who are yet to apologise. I'm thinking about, you know, Jake Humphreys on BT Sport and things like that. You know, he was very quick to talk about the actions of the fans on that night and we get to hear him say he got that wrong despite the report now landing on the table. So, yeah, it's... um, I think what's important now is what happens next. So, you know, um, UEFA seems to be run like a corner shop when it's supposed to be, you know, at the top of European football, organising huge events. And it's good to hear them called out, but but I would still... Worry. There are plenty of Liverpool fans, by the way, who would say, who say, and they mean it, they, would, they wouldn't go again. They, wouldn't, they don't want to go to a showpiece event organised by UEFA because they don't trust them to get it right. Now, that's what they need to build, that trust. They need, they need to tell us, and football in general, well, what are you going to do different next time there's a final? Uh, remarkable that no one lost their life uh, the words near miss and that's used in, in terms of a potential catastrophic loss of human life um, you know I, I think again you don't really want to think about how bad it might have been but you actually have to otherwise yeah. they might repeat the same issues this could happen again in Istanbul this year like who knows what's going to happen yeah I mean I saw it in the eyes of people who were there when, when they returned back to Liverpool um, you know I didn't go myself um, I actually had my son who really wanted to go and, you know, I'm, I'm delighted, obviously, with hindsight that we didn't go. Uh, but people who've come back said things like, you know, like I said already, you know, they, they don't want to go again. They don't trust your wayfair. A lot of people sort of felt almost, you know, they fell out of love with football a little bit because of that night, because of those incidents. And, you know, it, it, it a lot of times passed and I'm cynical about sort of when that's come out, it, it, it stinks of sort of trying to hide some news behind a big football match that it comes out when it does. Um, and yet UEFA have got a lot to prove to, to football that, you know, they're going to learn from this and they're, and they're going to make changes for this. But, you know, it's good to know and it's good to see that, you know, Liverpool, it's been put out there publicly once again that this is not down to Liverpool fans. And look, you only have to get, again, I always talk about the internet because people bat it off, but it is important and it is part of society. And that news breaks last night and some of the first comments are, this is ignoring who it is again. This is ignoring that it's Liverpool fans. So there's plenty of people still out there trying to trot a narrative around Liverpool fans somehow being at fault, uh, which is sad. Um, hopefully stuff like this helps to change that. Yeah. All right. We, we got to leave it there. Um, I, I guess before we finish up here, though, Gareth, uh, you're definitely feeling like, you know, the season is back alive again. All of a sudden, it's amazing what one result will do. 100%, yeah. And, you know, as I said before, Newcastle at the weekend, we've got Real Madrid after that and Crystal Palace away after that. Um, I always thought this 12-day period would be massive for Liverpool season. Hopefully now they can get it back on track. Gareth Roberts and Patrick Boylan, thanks a million, folks. Cheers. Cheers. It's uh, our review of the Merseyside Derby last night, which finished 2-0. Uh, 